Dixie Lee Ray, former governor of the state of Washington and author of the new book, Trashing the Planet. What's it all about? Well, the title might be, some people might think, a little misleading, unless you also read the, si the subtitle, which is how science can help with problems like acid rain and nuclear waste and depletion of the ozone and so on. It's about the environmental issues that get a lot of public attention these days. And the effort is to try to bring out the facts or the evidence that supports those charges or makes them uh, less believable, either way. Where'd you get the idea for the book? Well, since I retired, which was some years ago, I've been doing a certain amount of writing and book reviewing and uh, some speaking. And I find as I move around the country and, uh, and, and read a lot of the material that comes out in this field, that there's a great deal of misinformation. There's a great deal of fright. There's a great deal of um, misunderstanding of the actual science that's involved in these technical issues. And therefore, I think people are being unnecessarily worried and sometimes to the point where we're spending unnecessarily large sums of money to correct a problem that doesn't really exist. Where are you living now? I live on an island in the southern part of Puget Sound in my home state of Washington. One of the first things you do for us in this book is take us back to uh, the early days of your life. Yes. And obviously it must not be too sensitive, but you basically tell us in here that you're what, close to 77 years old? I will be 77 in about uh, two months, three months, yes. What, what about those early years did you uh, want us to know? That times have changed enormously. <clears throat> that over the course of a single lifetime, and I have to tell you, I've beat the odds. When I was born, my life expectancy was much less than the number of years that I have actually lived. And one of the reasons for that is that life has become better. We are we're living in a cleaner environment. We're more healthy. Uh, we are, have greater relief from hard physical labor. And all in all, it's a better life than it used to be. So I describe what it was like when I grew up. It was dirty. It was um, smelly. There were very few household appliances that could help with the drudgery of housework. Uh, sickness was a fact of life. Infectious diseases um, always struck every year, and particularly for children, many did not survive. Tuberculosis was rampant. We sometimes forget all those things when we think about the, quote, good old days when life was more simple. Uh, we didn't have fresh vegetables in the winter time because we didn't have refrigeration, uh, because CFCs hadn't been invented, and so there wasn't any freon gas, and so on and so on and so on. I try to make the contrast of all the things that have happened to improve life uh, in the course of my 77 years of being here. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Tacoma, Washington. That's where I was born. What did your parents do? My, par my father was a printer, a commercial printer, and uh, mother was uh, a housewife and a good mother, took care of the five children. All of us were girls. And so we had, uh, we had quite a good squabbling ho a household. How many of your <laughs> sisters are still alive? All of them. Younger or older? I'm number two. They, they all live out in the Northwest? No, uh, uh, my older sister and I live together uh, in our family place on Fox Island. I have two younger sisters that live in Oregon and one in California. I don't know if I remember this correctly, but did you say in here that the invention of the Model T Ford helped the smell because it got the manure off the streets? Uh, yes, I did. Is that really true? Is that it, is can really you remember true. that? Oh, yes. Um, I can remember the smell. I can remember the pervading smell of horse manure in every, every community. Streets weren't paved except in the main downtown areas of, of towns as large as, as, a, as a place like Tacoma. And there were all kinds of horse-drawn vehicles, and the poop just filled up the streets. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about the smell of the coal? And coal, yes. Beginning about 1920, when I first went to school, um, I, I recall the, the coal smell, particularly during the wintertime, because that's what almost everyone built, burned in a furnace or a fireplace in order to keep warm. Where'd you go to school? I went to school in the public schools of the city of Tacoma, Sherman School, up through the sixth grade. Then I went to a middle school uh, and then to high school in, in uh, Tacoma called Stadium High. It's a very interesting old building, still exists, and graduated <clears throat> from there in 1933. How about, how about college? My undergraduate work was at Mills College in California and my graduate work at Stanford. And what, what did you do when you first uh, got into professional life? I took in my first position after my graduate studies were completed uh, was in the faculty of the University of Washington in Seattle 
and I taught and did research there and for 26 years. And your degree was in what? Zoology, specifically marine biology. Where'd you get interested in that? I suppose the interest went way back to my childhood because um, uh, even though we were not uh, a family of great means, we always were able to go out uh, to some place around the Sound, around Puget Sound, to a beach area, a cabin on an island or something like that, and spend our holidays. That's how we happened to acquire the property on Fox Island, uh, where I live now. And I, I became very interested in the, uh, the animals that you could see when the tide was out, and in fishing, swimming, things like that. Where did you get the name Dixie Lee, Ray? Well, as you probably remember, after the Civil War, there was uh, quite a migration of people uh, from particularly North Carolina and Virginia. And the, the greater numbers of uh, people who left the South went either to Brazil, where there's quite a colony of former North Americans there, or to the Pacific Northwest. And it was our, my grandparents' generation that came west, and um, we are descended from the uh, families of uh, particularly North Carolina. After 26 years at the University of Washington, what? Well, I got a telephone call from President Nixon and asked me if I would be willing to take a, um, a position on the Atomic Energy Commission. And so, you really want to know? Okay. Uh, I, I talked to the people in the White House. I had two questions. One of them was, uh, was it a full-time job? The answer was yes. The second one was, would I have to live in Washington, D.C.? The answer was yes. So my response was no. I'm doing what I like to do. Besides teaching at the university, I was also directing uh, a kind of science museum for public understanding of science called the Pacific Science Center in Seattle. I said, I'm doing what I like to do. It occupies all my time, and I'm living where I like to live, so thanks anyway. Three months later, I was sworn in as a member of the Atomic Energy Commission. <laughs> Presidents can be very uh, persuasive. How did he change your mind? He convinced me that um, it would be an opportunity to enter into a new area, era uh, and to a new uh, field of science and perhaps to do something about public understanding, which was my my primary interest. Besides, it reminded me of the president of my undergraduate college, Mills. When I was there, president was Aurelia Henry Reinhardt, a very remarkable woman. She was, in fact, the first PhD woman uh, to receive a PhD degree from Yale University. And she told me, she knew all the students quite well. <clears throat> when I was getting my master's degree there, she said, Dixie, you know, you should, you should really develop your skill in your chosen field. But if ever there comes an opportunity to do something else, then don't turn it down. Because every time you, you, you change and move into a, a different or a new area, you will enlarge your horizons and it will be very rewarding. And she was right. How long did you serve on the Atomic Energy Commission? Until it was, um, uh, it was uh, decommissioned, shall we say, by the Congress, which was a total of three years. Then what? I was the last chairman. I stayed in Washington for a short time, and I was the assistant secretary for oceans and international environmental and technical science in the Department of State. But um, that was not the kind of thing that I found I was um, either very interested in or very good at. And so I returned home uh, to the state uh, to try to make up my mind what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I was, I was then over 60 years old. I had become really quite interested in this whole field of the interaction of science and public policy and the uh, recognition that actions in government uh, have an enormous influence on what our economy will do and what science as it affects the economy will do. I had come to the conclusion that at the federal level things are so enormous and so complex that it's, um, it's difficult for a especially for an individual, to make any, any impact. But I had uh, reached the conclusion that at the state level, uh, there was a great deal that, that could be done to improve the functions of government, particularly in the technical areas. And so I decided to give it a, give it a try. I was much too old to start at the bottom, so I decided to start at the top. How? I ran for governor. As a Democrat? Well, you have to, uh, let, me, let me say this. I've never been really interested in party politics. 
Uh, but to, to run for a major office, you have to declare yourself, either a, a Democrat or a Republican, if you want to be elected. And as I looked at the situation there, I saw that the Republican slate was full. The Democrats were in total disarray as usual, so I ran as a Democrat. And won. And won. Yes, sir. One term? One term. What did you think of that experience? It was, it was really tremendous. You know, there's nothing else quite like it. There are only 50 jobs like that in the whole world. Um, it's, it's a little bit like I've heard airplane pilots uh, describe flying a big airplane. Uh, moments of exhilaration, hours of sheer boredom, and uh, seconds of absolute, uh, I think that word shouldn't be used on air. <laughs> um, and and in, in a way, it's like that. A governor is, is the, the head of the administration of state government, must work with and through the, uh, the legislative body. But nevertheless, the governor as a single individual stands out and is therefore held responsible for everything, even things that don't come under your jurisdiction at all. And you're dealing with problems on a daily basis that are very intractable. Many of them don't really have solutions, and yet you have to do everything you can. And uh, some progress can be made. What years were you governor? 1977 to 1981. Tell me if I'm wrong about this. I remember one thing about you. There was a picture that I saw somewhere of you and a dog. And did you live in a trailer? No, sir. It was a motorhome. Motorhome. Yes, sir. Now, th it that caused... picture was published more than once. Well, it happened to come out on the front page of the Washington Post. The dog was sitting at my desk in the State Department at that time. But he was a little poodle. It was wonderful. But when you went on to be governor, didn't you carry on this life of, uh, of, of the outdoorsman, outdoors woman, you know? Well, uh, certainly. Uh, I mean, did you travel around your motorhome then? No, no, because um, I, I had my home on the island, and of course I lived in the governor's mansion. When that was only about an hour's drive away from the island, and when I could, I got home for weekends. But um, uh, our, our lifestyle there is very much out of doors. It's a very relaxed and, and rural area. But I had my dogs with me, yes. I had two poodles while I was governor. This is uh, just some fun things that you have in here. Um, you, you've used some words, but you describe, I mean, normally when you read about these words, you don't, you know, people use them, you don't know where they come from. And I just want to ask you, about these, are, this, these are non sequiturs. You use the word saboteur. Where does the word, and, and why did you use that, and where does it come from? Well, the, a saboteur is a kind of an industrial terrorist. And the word actually comes from the early days of the Industrial Revolution in France. The workers who felt that they, the mills, particularly the textile mills, were taking away their jobs. They'd pull off their wooden shoes and throw them into the machinery to block it. And of course, the, the French word for wooden shoe is sabat. So they're saboteurs. And the yes. word distaff. Distaff. Well, that's a very interesting one. Um, it, it comes to us from medieval times. And the very first sort of technology that freed women from total bondage was spinning. And the way that spinning was done at that time was to take the threads and wind them up on a stick, uh, about uh, as big around as your finger and about uh, a dozen, 15 inches long. The, st the stick was called a distaff. And, it, and the thread was wound up there and then uh, and it twisted uh, and then um, uh, eventually uh, we woven into, into cloth. Now, the men did the weaving, but the, the women uh, produced the thread. And the invention of the spinning wheel, which did away with the distaff, was about sometime around the 15th century. And it meant that instead of uh, about nine women busy with a distaff making enough thread to keep one weaver busy, one woman with a spinning wheel could make enough thread to keep six weavers busy. So for the first time, her work became valuable in the marketplace. And in a way, this also related at the same time things happened. It may have been coincidence, but it happened at the time women became, uh, earned the first possibility of economic independence. At that same time, at least in the Western world, women earned the right to inherit from their husbands, uh, to keep uh, the, the, the property that they brought into a marriage through a dowry, uh, and, to and to own property in their own name. And those were very significant steps forward. So that uh, the word uh, spinster comes down to us from those days referring to the woman 
who decided to support herself through spinning rather than to marry, uh, or for a variety of reasons, was not married, to have a man support her. So an independent woman was called a spinster. Did you ever marry? No. When you look back on uh, where you've come from, do you think that women in our society are doing well today? Well, let me assure you, first of all, I don't brood on these problems. And secondly, I think that the opportunities for women now are just absolutely without end and so much more than they have been in the past. Uh, again, this is another area, I don't emphasize it in this book, where tremendous change has taken place. When I was a student in college, if it had been possible, I would have become an engineer. But it wasn't possible because engineering colleges would not admit women. Even as late as 1952, when I had a Guggenheim Fellowship and chose to take, uh, take it for six months at Caltech, uh, I was there because I came with my own fellowship as a postdoctoral uh, student. And there were no women allowed in the undergraduate body or even accepted in the graduate school at that time. Now, 1952 is not, it's not a thousand years ago, you know. And so much change has taken place now. There's nothing that isn't open to a woman if she has the talent and the interest and the will to do it. Let me read back. Um, and this book is, let me see how many pages exactly, 206 pages. Back on page 165, you write this. Activist environmentalists are mostly white, middle to upper income, and predominantly college educated. They are distinguished by a vocal do-good mentality that sometimes successfully cloaks a strong streak of elitism, which is often coupled with a belief that the end justifies the means and that violence and coercion are appropriate tactics. Yes. I want to make sure that I emphasize I was speaking there about the radical leadership of the activist part of the environmentalist movement. I was not speaking about all the fine, sincere people who belong to the Ottoman Society and the Nature Conservancy and all those other organizations. I was speaking about the, the, the real leadership of those organizations that are the most outspoken and most active and most radical. Are they harmful, yes. in your opinion? Yes, they are. I Why? They are. Because they, their actions, whether purposeful or not, and I think in most cases it is purposeful, are directed toward tearing down industrial society. They seem to believe, and they often say this outright, that industrial, industrialization is wrong and that human beings should not live in this way, that we should find a way to go back to live in some kind of nice pastoral, pleasant way where everybody runs out and gathers berries and honey from the bees and that kind of thing. But industrialization is harmful. Uh, from, the, from their speeches and from their books, it's clear that most of them don't really like people very well. And some come right out and say, as it was in an editorial in the London Economist in December of 1988, I think, that, um, and I'm quoting now as well as I can remember, the extinction of the human uh, species is not only inevitable, but may be a good thing. There is this strong strain somehow of anti-human, um, anti-person uh, attitude that worships nature and uh, believes that man is an intruder into nature. Let me read some more. This is the page before. However, the leaders of some of their organizations, such as the Natural Resources Defense Council, Friends of the Earth, Earth First, Greenpeace, Government Accountability Project, Institute for Policy Studies, and many others are determinedly leftist, radical, and dedicated to blocking industrial progress and unraveling industrial society. Yes, sir. Do you feel strongly about this? I tried to make it clear, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you get your intense feelings about this kind of thing? Uh, from the actions and the, the actual words of the people that uh, I'm quoting there. And there are a number of quotes that, that express how they want to destroy uh, the basis of industrialization. I suppose it first became evident to me through the, the anti-nuclear movement. Anti-nuclear uh, movement was one of the most outspoken early ones, um, and uh, it was aimed really at destroying our ability to make electricity. Electricity is really the lifeblood of modern society. You're not concerned at all about nuclear power uh, being a, a negative? No, not when it's done right, but you have to do right with everything. You know, the internal combustion engine is a pretty dangerous thing unless you handle it right. And uh, we've had an exceedingly fine record in the nuclear industry. It's a record of safety can't be matched by any other industry. What's the status of nuclear power in the country right now? Right now, 110 operating nuclear power plants. 
They're producing a little over 20% of our electricity today in this country. It's an established uh, industry, and I think it's here to stay. And I think that we're going to see in the future, as we recognize that our capacity to make electricity is uh, being overcome by the need and the demand for more electricity, we're going to realize that, in, that using <coughs> nuclear energy is probably the best way to, to supply the, the additional amounts that we're going to need. When did we build the last nuclear power plant? Oh, there are several came online last year. Are they building some now? I think there's still some under construction. There haven't been any new orders in a decade, but there haven't been any new orders for big coal plants either, or big hydroelectric dams either. It's because uh, the, the enormous amount of construction that took place during the 60s and early 70s built a surplus of capacity, and we haven't had to build new generating plants until now, and now we're going to have to. What do you think of the government's and you used to be a member of the Atomic Energy Commission. Is that not now the Nuclear Regulatory Commission? Yes, and part of it is, of course, in the Department of Energy. The AEC was split into two parts. Half of it, the, the actual production and, and development of the source into the Department of Energy and the regulation into the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. How do you assess how well those organizations are doing when it comes to regulating nuclear power? Well, the only one that regulates is the NRC. I think that they bend over backwards. I think that uh, they're sometimes tougher than they need to be, but that's all right. Would you have, with it. If you wanted, would you change anything? Yes. What would that be? Uh, having to go through the same process twice. The same process takes place when, you, when a, a, a utility that intends to build a plant applies for a license to build it, and then they have to go through the whole thing again when they, after it's built and they get a license to operate. I think that that's unnecessary. It is certainly costly, and it is a duplication. And I think those two things need to be combined. This book um, called Tracing the Planet is put out by, how do you pronounce it? Regnery. Regnery Gateway. Gateway yes. Where are they located? Here, here in Washington, D.C. And what kind of books do they normally publish? They're a conservative press. It's an old line uh, publishing house. Not the largest, but a very well established and well, well thought of. Mostly they publish books in um, uh, government and history and politics. They have published, for example, uh, Senator Goldwater's books. Uh, they were the ones that published uh, books uh, written by uh, uh, William Buckley, Pat Buchanan, to mention a few names that are probably familiar to people. And who is this gentleman right here, Lou Guzzo? Guzzo. Guzzo. Yeah, Lou Guzzo. He was formerly, when I first met him, the managing editor of the Seattle Post Intelligencer, which is a big uh, daily newspaper in um, uh, in Seattle. We became well acquainted and began to work together. He is a journalist in the finest sense of the word, a journalist who believes in reporting the news and um, if you're going to editorialize on it to do that uh, specifically in an essay that's that's labeled an editorial. Um, he and I have worked together quite a lot. When I was governor he was on my staff as as a counselor and as head of the uh, of the uh, Arts Commission <coughs> and Historical Preservation Group. We've been associated for a long time, and, he, and uh, uh, his contribution primarily was to be sort of a, a pre-editor editor and my sounding board. When you know something and have worked with it a lot, it's hard to describe it for people who don't know about it. That is, you assume lots of times that people know things that they don't, or uh, uh, you'll unnecessarily use words that aren't in the common vocabulary. So he was the one that watched out for things like that. Did you write it yourself, the book? Yes, and every, th every word he went over. In the beginning, you have uh, this dedication. You say this book is dedicated to two groups of people. One, to all those honorable men and women of science and engineering, past and present, who work to better the conditions for human life on this planet. Why, though? Why those, that group? What's, what was Because those are the scientists that uh, have developed the kind of information that we use in the book. They're the ones who who, who developed the evidence uh, and the information on all these subjects. How are we doing as a country in the, in the areas of science and engineering today? We do very well indeed, except in one area, and that's teaching non-scientists about it. Why is that? I don't know. If I knew, I'd, I'd have tried to do something about it. Do you do any more <laughs> teaching yourself? No, I, my teaching has, has been over many, many years, but uh, I don't do any active teaching at the present time. Second part of your dedication was to all those sensible citizens mm -hmm. who may wonder or worry about all the environmental fuss, what it's all about, uh, but whose access to facts is limited to the hyperbole of the popular media 
are technical papers that are replete with qualifications and footnotes and are seldom written in common language. We have tried to be true to the first group while serving the second. Uh, sounds like there's a little hostility in that second part there about uh, possibly the popular media and these technical papers. Tell us more. Well, only, uh, I, I wouldn't say hostility, critical, yes, because I think the popular press, whose job is not to inform the public, uh, but to report on things that they see that they think are important, um, the popular press doesn't always give uh, more than one side. The popular press uh, tends, quite understandably, to pick out things that are sensational and develop them. And I think they have been responsible, in many cases, for unnecessarily frightening people. Uh, so yes, I think that there's uh, room for criticism there. And uh, turning now to the scientific press, most scientists write papers for their peers uh, and not for the public. And therefore, uh, it's, uh, it's quite common that uh, people outside their own field may not understand them at all. But there's so much of interest in science. There's so much in science and technology that's important and that uh, people can get excited about if they just know about it. They can't know about it and get their information from either the popular press or the technical papers. There has to be an effort to interpret and an effort to reach people with information uh, couched in language that people can understand. Why do you say that the, the press understandably has to go for the sensational? Because that's what they always tell us, that they have to sell papers. You think that's true? No. No, because I, I think that uh, there's one area of the popular press where they report accurately. They never misspell a name. They never give an inaccurate figure. And they report things as they happen, quite objectively. And that's the sports. Is that right? Are you do, you ever, do, you ever, do you ever find any errors in the sports page? What? If, if, you, if you go to a game or you see a game and then you read about it and so on, they really report the things as they did happen. If you go to a... Um, uh, some other public event, that's not always the case. Now, if they can report accurately in sports, I think they can report accurately in other affairs, too. Why do you think they approach it differently? Sports versus general Tradition, news? Probably. Habit. Most reporters um, are not uh, well-versed in science, but most reporters, like most people, um, do have an interest in sports, and, and many of them uh, make it their business to learn about it uh, in great detail. Are you a sports fan? Uh, some sports, yeah. You say on page 23, um, here we are in the final decade of the 20th century, a once buoyant nation with unbounded faith in the future and in our ability to make it better, but now so possessed by self-doubt and recrimination and so frightened that something might go wrong that we are unwilling to accept even minute amounts of personal or environmental risk. It seems that way. Um, I think that uh, there's plenty of evidence that, let's take the field of health, that, uh, that people are, are, are so afraid that something that they eat or something they might do will give them cancer. There's a cancer mania in the country. And actually, uh, much of the, uh, of the fear of uh, cholesterol and uh, red meat and all those things, it, it, it really quite misplaced. Chapter uh, four, greenhouse earth. Are you worried about the greenhouse effect? Oh, no. Of course the earth is, uh, acts as a greenhouse. If it didn't, we wouldn't be able to live here. With that atmosphere cover that we have all over the surface of the earth does act like a blanket. It both keeps some of the sun's rays out and uh, holds others in and moderates the temperature. It is the, in, it's the changing of the composition of the atmosphere, specifically by uh, an increase in the amount of carbon dioxide, perhaps a number of other things, that people have uh, seized upon and claimed that due to human activity, enough carbon dioxide is being produced that's actually going to modify the climate in a way which will be, according to some authors, uh, quite drastic or even catastrophic by causing it to warm up. And I think that it's quite clear the evidence is not there to support that. T take the average citizen has doesn't know anything about science, they just read the headlines. They keep reading that there's this greenhouse effect that the earth is getting hotter. Mm -hmm. how, how can we as average people find out what is actually the truth? Well, you, you've put your finger on exactly the problem. 
Everybody thinks the earth is warming up because everybody says so. But they never give you any evidence. What are the facts? Do, they, do these stories that talk about the earth warming up tell you exactly what the temperature has been for the last 50 years? Or whatever, it's not so hard to find out. The fact is we have temperature records. They go back not 50 years, but probably 150 years. And those temperature records show that there is no warming trend. Just a few weeks ago, uh, a new study was published by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology analyzing 150 years of temperatures of the surface of the sea. And you have some years when it warms up a little bit and some years when it cools down a bit. And so on, there's fluctuation. But there's no long-term trend. Tyros 2, one of our satellites, was sent up in 1978 and for 10 years, 78 to 88, took continuous temperature records all over the surface of the Earth, over the land as well as the sea. And as a result of those 10 years of records, no warming trend at all. We should say to the people that um, are publishing headlines, the Earth is warming, watch out, watch out, say, how do you know? What's the evidence? All we have to do is to ask for the evidence. And it's quite clear that the problem does not exist. It is estimated that banning CFCs, first of all, what are CFCs? CFCs are chlorofluorocarbons, or more commonly known as freons. And it was the invention of freon gas that made widespread use of refrigeration possible. In my days of my youth, as I describe in that early chapter, the best you could do was to have an ice box. And you put ice into it, and as the ice melted, it would keep other things cool. But the invention of refrigeration, and uh, refrigeration that could be handled in a unit, that could be put into a, a, an, an ordinary home, and uh, was economical enough for an average family to be able to afford. That came about only after Freon was invented or discovered. And it is the, the prime refrigerant of the uh, refrigeration industry. When you stop to think about how many things use refrigeration, and what a tremendous effect that has had upon the safety of our food, as well as our comfort and air conditioning and all manner of other things, uh, you can see that freons are extremely important. And those people who have claimed that the freon gas destroys ozone in the, in the uh, stratum above the atmosphere have called for and have succeeded in getting governments to agree to ban the use of freon. What are we going to use for refrigeration then? Where's freon come from, you know? Uh, the major manufacturer of freon gas in this country is DuPont. What is it? Chlorofluorocarbon. It's a pretty big molecule with chlorides <laughs> and carbons and fluorides. Sorry yes. I asked. That's all right. But you say here it is estimated that banning CFCs would mean changing or replacing capital equipment valued at $135 billion. That's right. Do you think that we as a country will ever ban CFCs? It was done already. It's been done. Completely? Yeah. Can't be used anymore? That's right. It isn't being manufactured anymore. But what about the, the old... Well, they'll be phased out, of course. It means that in the future, refrigeration is going to be very much more expensive. Whether there is going to be possible to develop a substitute for Freon is still debatable. And this, the substitutes that are being looked at right now will require units that are much larger than the ones we have here, so that having, a, say, an air conditioner in your car may become very unlikely or extraordinarily expensive. What when year? you think about all of the, of the air conditioners, um, uh, all of the uses of refrigeration in grocery stores and department stores and everything you can think of. Um, it, it is a big, big problem. What year will we see as consumers this uh, starting to affect us? Uh, very soon. I don't know. I can't put the, the date onto it. The year was 1989 when 11 nations met in Montreal, Canada and agreed to what's called a protocol that they would phase out the use of, of CFCs. Now, CFCs are used not only for refrigeration, but also in firefighting. You know, this foam that's used on um, airfields? CFCs. They're called, they're called halons. What are you going to use instead? Uh, these materials are used in the electronics industry in making sure that uh, these very, very delicate parts for electronic equipment are clean. You're going to have to develop some other kind of a solvent. Why did we as a nation go along with that? Because we're stupid. Sorry, I don't mean stupid. I say uninformed and listen to the fear mongers. The fear mongers say CFC is getting up into the ozone and destroying it. There's no evidence for that at all. 
It is all based on computer simulations, computer modeling. And the computer models um, apparently are being believed by a lot of people. So as we sit here, um, what do you see will be the replacement? I don't know. I'm not, I'm, I'm not in the chemical industry business. Um, I don't know what kind of refrigeration it can be. Perhaps we have to go back to using ammonia. They used to use ammonia to make, to make ice, you know, or sulfur dioxide. Both of those things are very much more difficult to handle and really quite toxic. Again, you don't know what year we will see any No, impact. because it may be that as uh, freon gas becomes unavailable, people will begin to wake up and realize what we've done to ourselves. I hope that's the truth. Chapter 5, Acid Rain. Bothered about it? No. Not a bit. Should the Canadians be bothered about it? No. Shouldn't be. And one of the reasons we can say that is that there has been a 10-year study uh, costing something in excess of $500 million. And over 500, 600 of the best scientists in this country, um, atmospheric scientists, geologists, biologists, and so on, studying the acid rain problem under a requirement put down by the Congress of the United States. And the end result of this study, which came out just last year, it's called NAPAP, the National uh, Acid Precipitation Assessment Program, uh, showed that except for a very small number of lakes in New England and northern New York State, representing no more than 4% of the total number of lakes, that have become acidified probably because of increased sulfur dioxide in that area. There actually is no environmental damage that can be traced to acid rain. And that those lakes can be corrected by liming, putting lime into them, or better, putting lime around the edge so that the, uh, the overflow will drain into the lake at a total cost of around uh, a few million dollars. Instead of that, the Congress, even though they had the study available to them in 1990, passed the Clean Air Act, which includes provisions for uh, acid rain uh, uh, correction, which will cost hundreds of billions of dollars. It's a multi-billion dollar solution for what is at most maybe a million dollar problem. Where does acid rain come from? Well, the rain itself is always acid. The reason it's acid is that water dropping through the atmosphere will pick up some carbon dioxide and form car carbonic acid. So the, the actual pH, as it's called, the acidity of rain is always a little bit below normal. When it hits the ground, then uh, it can be neutralized if the ground itself is kind of alkaline. Or if the ground is acid too, then of course it just adds, adds to it. And in many parts of our country, the ground is so alkaline that you can never get an acidic reaction on it. This is most of the West and the Southwest, for example. But at any rate, um, the, uh, uh, the rain as it falls th through the atmosphere can also pick up other materials. And if there's sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, then the, some of those droplets of rain may pick that up and form sulfuric acid. And that is generally what is believed to cause the rain to become more acid than the pH of about 5 or 5.4 that it normally is. 7 is neutral. Anything below 7 is more acid. Put yourself in the White House and <clears throat> Mr. Mulroney calls you and says, President Ray, you've got to do something about this acid rain. What do you say to him? I say, sir, we've got a 10-year study that's looking into that. And the results are out in 1990. The results show that you don't really have that kind of a problem. Not but, coming from this country, you don't. You know, the, all of the big, um, I shouldn't say all, many of the big um, um, smelters of Canada, uh, smelting ore, are located in southeast Canada. They don't have the kind of emission controls on them that we require in this country. And many studies, even before this national 10-year study that took place in this country, have shown over and over again that most uh, fallout of rain that is really acid happens in the vicinity of where the sulfur dioxide is produced. It doesn't travel long distances. It's been found in Norway. It's been found in England. It's been found in Germany. It's been found in the continent. And it's true here, too. What if he says then, um, you know, Mr. President, Madam President, um, <laughs> i got to do something about this problem. I've got a lot of heat up here. you got to help me. Well, you know, the, the best way to cure a problem is to know what the truth is, to know what the facts are. And that's really one of the problems we face right now.
I'd say throughout Western civilization. Uh, these problems, and there are some that exist, are trying to be solved politically without calling upon the evidence and the facts that are there to make, make it possible for people to make decisions as to whether the problem is real and whether the problem requires an expensive solution. I think one of the worst things that's happened has been the asbestos problem. Even the EPA now admits that asbestos is not a problem as far as human health is concerned. That is the kind of asbestos that is used in building insulation and for fire retardation and soundproofing and things like that. Right from the very beginning, they didn't, let the, they didn't tell the public that there are two major varieties of, of asbestos. And the kind that gave people lung problems and led to lung cancer and asbestosis of the lung, that is a kind that was only used during World War II and only in shipyards. But those people were exposed and they did get lung problems. But the kind of asbestos that is used in school buildings does not cause that problem at all. And yet it has cost school districts in this country $120 billion last year alone to remove asbestos totally unnecessarily. So where is it all coming from? It comes out of the school budget. And that's $120 billion that we can't spend educating young people because you have to take the asbestos out. I'm sorry, I asked the wrong question. Sorry. Where does the controversy come from? Why oh, are people they, convinced that they oh, have okay. to pull the asbestos out of school? All right, because several years ago, the Environmental Protection Agency announced that asbestos use was banned, and any of it that was in place had to be removed. And they won't change the rule. Why, even why were they convinced that they had to change the rule? Because of a mimeographed paper which came out of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, as it was known at that time, when Mr. Califano was the secretary. That was a paper that made some wild claims about the dangers of asbestos. It was never reviewed in the scientific literature. It was ridiculed and criticized by um, uh, established scientists all over the world. And yet, it was accepted by uh, HEW, and it was uh, used by the EPA as a basis for banning asbestos. Again, why do you think that's the case? I mean, why do people, if there's no basis, why do they keep making these decisions? Well, it's like passing laws. It's awfully easy to get a law passed. It's awfully difficult to get it unpassed. It's relatively easy to pass regulations, make rules, but they're seldom retracted. I suppose it's human nature. Nobody likes to admit having made a mistake. Are you saying that in a case like asbestos, that the issue was presented to the Congress and to HEW or to the press, and none of them asked the tough questions to get to the bottom of the fact that you say there was nothing to be alarmed about? Apparently so. I can only hope that that's the case, that they passed it in uh, the, uh, the rulings regarding the, this would be the EPA, uh, regarding the um, uh, requirement to remove asbestos in ignorance. Otherwise, I can understand why it would be done if they, if they had known, as they should have, that as the asbestos, remember there are two kinds, the asbestos that is used in the, in the um, bra uh, um, school buildings and so on is not a dangerous kind. Incidentally, it's also used in brake linings. And you can't use it in brake linings anymore because you can't use asbestos anymore. And therefore, modern brakes are not as good as uh, on the modern cars they have been. And what you may not, I think the public doesn't realize is it is probably asbestos and the ban on asbestos that caused the Challenger disaster. It wasn't the O-rings themselves that failed. It was the putty that held the O-rings in place. And up until that time, the time of the, of the Challenger, that putty had had asbestos in it to strengthen it and make it fire retardant. When the asbestos was removed, it was the putty that gave way. Where does asbestos come from? It's a mineral. It's very widespread in nature. Most of the asbestos that we use in this country, probably 95% of it, is mined in southeast Canada. And it's, uh, it's very clear that in the area where it's actually mined and milled and produced for commercial use, there is no uh, lung problems, no respiratory epidemics or anything like that in the workers or the miners or the miners' families or the people that live in the area uh, where it is all being handled. Another interesting thing is that 40% of all the, the rock outcroppings in the San Francisco Bay Area contain this type of asbestos. And since those rocks weather, there's a lot of asbestos fiber in the air, there's a lot of it in the drinking water and so on, there's no epidemic of any problem from that material at all in the San Francisco Bay Area. 
it's not that kind of widespread uh, asbestos and in, in widespread use that causes any problem. It's no worse breathing it than breathing coal dust or, or house dust or anything else. You'll always find a few people that have a very sensitive respiratory system that will get an allergic reaction to these things. And of course, if you're overwhelmed with it, you know, if you breathe clouds of it, then, then there's bound to be a respiratory reaction. But the, the normal uh, amount of it that floats around in the air does not cause any problem. Alar. That uh, is a famous case uh, because that one was deliberate. The people who, uh, who proposed that Alar uh, was a cancer-producing substance and was put on apples did it, uh, for what reason I don't know, but did it knowing that their information uh, was certainly misleading, if not outright wrong. And I think that uh, the suit which is now underway, a multi-million dollar suit against CBS and against the program 60 Minutes and against the Natural Resources uh, Defense Council who, who originated uh, the story, uh, that is in the courts at the present time because um, it can be shown that they knew that their information was, uh, was misleading. The only way that they were able to get a, uh, an effect on laboratory animals uh, by feeding them alar was to feed them enough so that if, it, if you were the human equivalent of having to eat 28,000 pounds of apples per day for 70 years. Now that'd be a pretty hard thing to do, even for one year. And if they fed the, the, the laboratory animals only 14,000 pounds, equivalent of 14,000 pounds of apples per day, they didn't get any bad reaction at all. I know you know this sensation. There's a lot of people sitting out there right now listening to this saying, mm -hmm. oh, I can't, can't believe, believe she's uh -huh. saying this. Now, I want to go, the reason I bring this up, because I want to go back to the first chapter, second paragraph, you write this. She says, now my disclaimer, colon, I am not in the pay of, nor am I employed by any industry, and I am as much opposed to pollution as anyone. That's true. Let me go through that. You didn't write this book for any financial gain oh. at all from any corporation oh, no. that will enjoy listening to you knock down all these. No way. None? None. No money involved in this at all? No, no. The only thing that comes in is from the sale of the book, and uh, we hope that people will buy it, but so that's all. Do you need this sale of this book, and uh, this is a personal question, to live on it? Is this money no. that you need to live on? No, I'm retired and I live on Social Security and a small government pension like everybody else does. But um, it's always nice to have a little extra cash. And I have to go out and earn some, which I do by consulting and speaking primarily, or doing book reviews and so on, uh, in order to pay the ever-increasing taxes. Are you a consultant to a corporation that will no. benefit? No. None? No. I'm a consultant on call uh, to the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory and the Los Alamos Laboratory, but uh, nothing that would benefit them in these books, no. So what motivated you? What really motivated you to do this? I mean, you've It goes back to the years of experience I had at the Pacific Science Center and in government in seeing the difficulty of uh, and the problems that evolved from scientific issues being misunderstood, and particularly in the political arena. You see, I'm a teacher at heart. I, I like to think that um, when people, and I do believe, that when, when the public has accurate information, they'll always make the right decision. Have you been any, in any debates over this issue? No, I've been asked to, but I consistently turned down the debate format. The reason being is that you cannot decide or conclude anything about a scientific or technical issue by argument. These issues can only be resolved by facts. And it's an awfully easy thing to say, um, LR is a carcinogen, and you make the charge. Then how do, you, how do you refute it? If you're a person who knows that that's not the case, it takes a long time to bring out the evidence that, is, uh, that will establish that it's not a harmful uh, material and it is not a carcinogen. The advantage is always with the person who makes a charge and never have to prove it. That's one thing we really need to change. We really need to say to people who say, uh, the earth is warming up, the ozone layer has got a hole in it. Say, how do you know? Prove it. What's the evidence? 
don't make the people that, that know what they have to prove that they're wrong. Let's go back to the two uh, bodies of individuals who are involved in, as you say, bringing about this change in, in acid rain and asbestos and radiation and all this. The media and the scientists. The, and as you say in the back, the radicals, the people involved and activists. What, what are the activist motives? Don't they, start, don't they want to clean the, the atmosphere up and make it a better place to live? No, they want to do away with industrialized society. Why? I don't know if I knew that. It would be easier to, you know, to find out what to do about it. But um, they don't want to have, let's say, safe nuclear power plants. Their answer is no, we want no nuclear power plants. Whenever you get a body of people who believe that the only way to deal with any problem is, is to ban it entirely, destroy it entirely, and you, I think, have to be very, very suspicious about what their ultimate motives are. And they reveal them in their writings. If you read what they write, and I have done this, um, uh, you read the book called Eco Defense, which describes how to go out and, and, and sabotage and c commit terrorist acts. And they give the rationale for it and the reasons. And they, they're perfectly open in saying that it is our intent to stop industrial progress, to undo industrial activity to take apart industrial civilization. Okay, then what's the m motive of the media that don't they want to just make things better? I have a hard time responding to a question about somebody else's motives. I don't really know what their motives are, but when, 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 you, when you talk with people or, or you'll, you'll hear what the people in the media say, um, they say, we just report the news as we, as we see it, and we have to sell papers or sell time on television or, or, or whatever. There's no requirement for a reporter to be either totally accurate or give both sides of any disputed question. Uh, it's not incumbent on him to do that. It is on a teacher or a scientist, but not on the reporter. Okay, I know you don't like to second guess someone's motives, but what about the politician? Why does the politician or the government official then follow what the media suggests are the, mo are the, the suggestions of the okay. activists? Okay, you know that I've spent some time in politics, and uh, to use a trite phrase, uh, some politicians are my best friends. However, there's a range of people in politics just like there is a range of people in any kind of profession. There are some characteristics, however, that you can make some generalizations about. And one of them is that any politician who stays in office for any length of time knows how to count. And I mean by that, he knows where the votes are. And if a, a, a person, especially one that's going to be coming up for re-election uh, in a short period of time, feels that there are more votes on one side of a question than other, um, they can find ways of rationalizing. And that's one of the reasons that I personally am extremely strong supporter of limitation of terms for people in public office. Because I think that the perceived need to get reelected uh, does uh, hamper a person's better judgment. I don't know, this may be too broad a question, but how do you rate government in general today? You mean the government of the United States? Yeah, just government, our government, the our state government. and national governments, are, are, are governments doing a very good job? Let me put it this way, if I may, that um, our government bumbles along. It makes a lot of mistakes, it does a lot of good things, and it's easy to criticize it. But when you stop to think about it, it's the best government that everybody ever invented. It's better than any alternative. And we can make it better by limiting the terms that people serve and making sure that it becomes a broader citizen-based government as it's supposed to be by constantly electing new people to office. Can't be any worse than the ones that are there. Does any other government do a better job, in your opinion, than the U.S. government no. does with all these issues? No. No. Nowhere. Fine. And the re and the result is absolutely obvious. You travel to any other country, and there is there is more air pollution, uh, there is there, there, there are more serious environmental degradation than in the United States. We have made tremendous strides in the last couple of decades. And we know where we made mistakes in the past, and those mistakes are being corrected. Final question, um, what do you hope will come from 
the writing of this book? What would, you, what would make you the happiest besides money? <laughs> besides lots of books being sold? Yeah. Well, of course. Uh, I would hope that it would cause more people to stop and think and demand, uh, in a nice way, demand evidence before accepting the charges that everything is going to pot. Former Washington State Governor Dixie Lee Ray, thank you for being with us and talking about the book Trishing the Planet. Thank you. I enjoyed being here.